Okay. All right. And we're live with Anthony Diorio. How are you, Anthony? I'm fantastic, Sonny. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So uh, I was going to say is, is a fun place to maybe start would be to uh, recollect when we first met. Uh, what I do know is that I knew of you before I actually probably met you physically. But do you even remember when we first met around what time frame? <laughs> I'm guessing it's in 2012 or 2000, early 2013, mm -hmm. I would think. And I'm guessing it was probably at a meetup. Yeah, so I, I think so. I, I think so. I think so. Um, I, I think your meetups were kind of, they they went beyond Toronto in the sense that because they were online, like the meetup.com website, people all over the world were kind of watching what, what was happening there. But I do remember 2012, 2013, what a what a what a time! Set almost seven years ago, right? <laughs> eight eight years ago. Eight years ago. Yeah, 2012 to 2020. I didn't end of 2020. Yeah, it's been it's been eight years since uh, I've been in the space. Yeah. Cool. So, so I guess I guess as I was mentioning before is, is that I I'm really interested in kind of learning about people's stories and kind of you know what they're lens if you will was uh, you know before learning about any of any of the stuff that we're, we're involved in right um and then kind of your your backstory i know you've shared it with us in some of the meetups that we did and big conferences back in the day but uh but i thought this would be a nice format to do it just between you and me <laughs> sure mm -hmm, sounds mm -hmm. good okay um so i guess my relevant history started when i was about eight years old, I think, with, uh, I was born in 1975, and uh, personal computers were, were kind of just, just coming out in the early 80s. Um, and I mean, for, from as long as I can remember, I've always been a, a computer person. I was building computers when I, before I was 10 years old. Uh, one of my first jobs was helping a family friend who built computers and had jobs doing um, networking for for schools and I think I must have been in my maybe about 11 or 12 when I was working with him installing uh, network cables in, in some schools that's like the the earliest job that I remember and and it was computers for me everything my dad brought brought home a, an IBM PC junior back in the early 80s and uh, I was hooked very early on um, starting to build computers, games, uh, and when the, I mean, before the internet, I was on modems, um, modems, the, the precursor to the internet and bulletin board systems where people could connect to other computers uh, via the phone line. So uh, well before the internet, I was, you know, deep involved in, in connecting with other computers and setting up bulletin board systems. And um, that took me up to I guess uh, the early '90s, when my first business that I ever started was a, was a web design company, and me and my brother had a company called Context Web Creations, and okay. it was it was I guess when HTML it was HTML one had come out, and I was learning HTML, HTML and um, we started designing websites and doing graphic design for for other companies uh, very early on. I, I went to university at, at Ryerson, did business management. I didn't want to do computers because that was something I knew really well, but I didn't want to be a, a programmer. And my dad was an entrepreneur and I went into business management and came out of Ryerson with a, a marketing degree and a, and a degree in international business uh, later on in the nineties. Uh, but computers was, was still my main thing. And uh, you know, when, I remember going into a computer lab at Ryerson when I first saw a web browser. Um, this would have been in the early 90s. And it was Mosaic was out at that time. And just, you know, that, that, was, that was a big thing for me. And I remember that and getting onto the internet and seeing how much easier it was, it was than having to connect to one single computer via modem. Um, and just uh, saw the, the, the rise of the internet and was a little, you know, not seasoned enough yet to really take advantage of the internet. Um, through the 90s and uh, graduated, as I said, with a marketing degree and went on uh, to spend a few years being a marketing director for a manufacturing company that manufactured emission systems uh, for heavy equipment. And that was just north of Toronto. So I was doing uh, trade shows, 
doing all their marketing materials, um, heading down to Vegas quite frequently, setting up their, their, their booths and did that for a few years. That took us into the early 2000s. Um, realized pretty early on though that I wasn't a fan of marketing. I've always felt that marketing is, is kind of trying to push something even if you don't necessarily believe in it and trying to get someone to buy something. Um, and I always felt that I needed to believe in something in order to sell it or and sell it. I never really liked sales. I, I, I didn't like marketing. I realized didn't like sales. I, I taken marketing as a major because I didn't know what else to do in university. I, I never really liked school. Uh, from very early on, I didn't like to be told what to do and uh, went through university, did it because it's the thing you did in my family. And uh, it was it was set up in that fashion where you go to university, you get a job and you start a family. This very normal lifestyle that I never really aligned with. Um, but I did it, I went through the task, but then in the early 2000s, um, decided to, to join the family business. So my dad and his brothers had a patio manufacturing uh, sliding door company or patio sliding door manufacturing company and uh, joined that became pretty well-rounded in business. I was taking care of the order desk and I was helping to hire people for, for the factory positions, a lot of office stuff and spent a number of years there kind of fine tuning and, and uh, my entrepreneurial uh, knowledge. And in 2008, um, my dad and his family or the, the family decided to sell the business and it wasn't an, it wasn't something I want to continue doing working for someone else so you know my dad came to me and said or mentioned to me you know you've got an opportunity to do something now what is it that you really would like to do and I thought about that and at the time I, I wanted to do something that was green focused and, and technology focused so we happen to have a family friend who uh, was doing what's called geothermal drilling back then and in 2008, 2009, I started uh, working for him. It was called Ground Heat International. And what he was a specialist at for, for decades was drilling holes into the ground and heating and cooling uh, buildings, residential buildings, commercial buildings. And at the time he had a need for drills. So uh, with the assistance of my dad, I set up a drilling company and, and we purchased these, this drill from, from Italy um went over there while it was coming off the production line and uh the gentleman I, that i'd been working for and that needed the drills uh, he had some jobs with ikea buildings in, in italy so i went over to italy and my drill was was used to do these hundreds of holes for for ikea in one in milan and I forget what the other one was but it was hundreds of holes that had to be done it was a month, month long project and did that and then brought it back to Toronto, the drill, and started uh, continuing doing doing drilling work uh, with these green technology of using the Earth's temperature to heat and cool buildings. Uh, That's so do, cool. Well, yeah. <laughs> sorry, it, sorry. Yeah. Go on. No, 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 no. It, it was it was really interesting, and um, it, the idea that you could use the Earth's temperature instead of using combustion, and uh, you're using the energy of the Earth pretty much to heat and cool buildings, so it has a, a really good payback period and after that you're not using gas or not using um, what you would normally be doing to, to heat and cool buildings. So I did that for a while, had a drilling company and then there was two issues that happened with that. Uh, one was that government started getting really involved with the, um, the process. They, were, they had some concerns that aquifers underground were being contaminated. I don't think it was founded, the, the concern, but it ended up slowing down the processes that we needed to do and already the, the, the drilling process would take a lot longer than you'd normally do installing uh, heating and cooling systems so further delays started really making it unfeasible feasible to to do these projects and that coupled with a at the time i think it was the harper government but there was a reduction in um uh, subsidies to do these green initiatives so the government involvement and the reduction of the, of the subsidies really impacted the entire space that was emerging at the time. And it became not really feasible to continue to do the work because of those two issues. So I ended up leasing the drill out to another drilling company that continued on doing that work. And I started again looking to see what it is that I wanted to do. And this was now around 2011. Um, 
around the same time, a little bit earlier, uh, my brother had, uh, who was a former politician up in Richmond Hill, he was a councillor, um, left office and was really studying and, and what, from what he had learned there about how governments work. And, and in particular, he was really studying the, the monetary system. And he, uh, in a way to try to help me understand what he was learning and doing, he uh, proposed that I understand really what money is. And I went on to YouTube and I started researching the history of money. And so what, through what that, year, hey Anthony, what year are we in now? This was two, 2010, 2011. 2010. Okay, 2010, okay. 2011. Um, and I spent a long time studying economics. It was also after the mm. whole housing crisis and the financial crisis in the, in the U.S. had happened. So the, the you know, learn what money is, is, is something I really started studying and really going back to, to barter transactions and going back when, when money was backed by things and, and then how that, trans, that changed when Nixon took the U.S. off the gold standard. And I really just became a, a, a student of, of economics and fell and fell into the Austrian school of economics. So I started studying um, what had happened with the financial crisis and the housing crisis. And I came across a, a video from a gentleman named Peter Schiff, um, who had these videos out there explaining what his perspective was, was on why we had a housing crisis and why we had the, the banking crisis and the financial crisis and started learning more about the contrarian model of economics, which is the Austrian model than as opposed to the Keynesian model. So I spent about a year and a half really digging into uh, Austrian School of Economics, digging into personal freedom, liberty, which really coincided with my feeling of, of not wanting to be told what to do and to, wanting to be in control of my life, which is what I, something I'd always, you know, really was was passionate about it coming from a family where it was you know you want to be normal you want to go to school you want to do these things because you want to be normal and I never liked being normal I, I thought normal was the opposite of what I ever wanted to be so that took me down the contrarian school of thinking about economics and really learning it and understanding what had happened with the financial crisis the housing crisis and the history uh, of the U.S. history of the Fed history of of fiat currencies and that was all well and good, but here I was in, in 2011, I dabbled in the gold and silver a bit, lost 20% of my investment that year. And it was in the summer of 2012, while I was um, continuing looking at, at freedom and looking at money where I went on to Google and I, and I put in freedom podcast. And because I'd been listening to Peter Schiff's podcast daily. And I said, well, I wonder if there's any others out here that might be interesting. And I came across a podcast called Free Talk Live. And Free Talk Live is a, a radio show that had been around for a number of years. And they were proponents of, of freedom, proponents of personal responsibility, proponents of sound money. Uh, and they were a show that had moved from Florida to New Hampshire in the US uh, and were involved with a movement called the Free State Project. And the Free State Project was a initiative to find the most free state in the U.S. and shift, move people that are freedom oriented over to that state to try and start getting involved in changing out government and changing out systems. So the hosts of that show have moved their, their podcast from Florida to New Hampshire. And there was a migration of people that happened all around the U.S. and actually some internationally that, that descended upon New Hampshire. And this was back in, I think, I think it started in early 2000s, the whole movement. Um, so they started doing a podcast there. And the first episode I listened to, they mentioned Bitcoin. And I had never heard of it before. This was middle 2012. And I looked it up. And that really was the genesis of, okay, um, I understand economics. I'm understanding the history of money. I, I'm a technology person that grew up you know, with with peer to peer file sharing, the Napsters, the uh, Kazaz, the you know that whole you know peer, uh, BitTorrent systems, and it was a culmination, I think, of all of these things, tech, mm -hmm. money, um, that that just I was I was enthralled by and by by Bitcoin, and immediately saw the potential. It wasn't one of those things, right? I looked at it and said, 
yeah, okay, this sounds good. And then got back to it a year later or something. <laughs> it was, it was, you know, and I, I know it's Andreas always, always mentions that everybody goes through that first time where you hear it and you dismiss it. And it's like, well, I never went through that period. The first day, the first day I found uh, local Bitcoins and I found someone on local Bitcoin. Mm. I went in them and I bought my first Bitcoin. Mm. And it was something like $9 and something cents at the time. Um, and uh, this gentleman, um, Ernest, who ended up coming to the first meetup that I had uh, a few months later, um, he had uh, just was, was purchasing Butterfly Labs uh, ASICs. <laughs> so this was just when, 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 when Butterfly Labs had announced the ASIC machine. So I went to his office to meet him to buy that Bitcoin. And he took me to the back and showed me his mining rigs that he had. They weren't Butterfly Labs yet, but he had mining rig, rigs that were offered. And he kind of explained to me what mining was. Because again, this is the first day I heard of it, of Bitcoin. And so I'm learning what mining is and, and, and quickly realized, well, do I want to mine or do I want to buy it? And um, at the time with Butterfly Labs, for those who don't know, it was the announcement that they were going to be coming up with the first application-specific integrated circuits to be mining Bitcoin. And there was a lot of hype around them. And they were doing pre-sales of their products and, and their mining rigs. And I remember going on to forums because I was uh, getting engrossed by, by the Bitcoin talk forums and just devouring that. And, and just, I wasn't, for the next few weeks, wasn't sleeping. I was just, just completely trying to catch up with, with this, this, this um, technology behind Bitcoin and, and learning more about it and, and trying to see if this is something that I, that I, I want to get interested in. So on the forums, they had, uh, geez, I don't remember, Josh, was it? I think, was it Josh from Butterfly Lab? I think it was Josh. And he was getting attacked and just uh, there were customers that were having problems. And, and he just seemed like a, kind of the opposite that I would ever treat a, a customer. He just was really rude and really obnoxious. And it, it was like, I, I don't think I want to be involved with somebody like this. I, I don't think I'm buying his equipment. I don't kind of trust what's going on with them the way that, that they're acting here. So that was actually because of that, I never got into mining. Um, I, I looked at it was thinking about buying a Butterfly Labs rig. I think it was about 30 grand at the time, the big rigs that they had. And just from the way that, that he acted and the way that he dealt with customers, I didn't get a good feeling from him. And uh, instead of, of getting any mining equipment, I ended up making a substantial purchase in, in 2012. Uh, I think it was about eight grand that I put into Bitcoin around somewhere around 10 bucks, 11 bucks. And I had my first like 800, 800 Bitcoin, I think I had a, from that. Yeah, it was something like that. So this was in 2012. And as I'm learning more about, about Bitcoin and, and studying it and what I can read online, uh, I felt it was, it was about time for me to start connecting with others, not necessarily in the digital realm, but to see if there were, were groups or anybody out there that was interested in, in, in the community, uh, you know, forming a community on Bitcoin. And I, I looked in Toronto and there was absolutely nothing at the time. There was a meetup in Vancouver, I think, the, um, that, it, that it started prior. But in Toronto, there was absolutely nothing. So I said, why don't, why don't I start it up? And I went on to meetup.com and, and I set up a group and, and um, set up the first, the first event. At the time I was living north of the city, uh, I wanted to do it in downtown Toronto because I thought it would be the most convenient for most people that would be coming around different areas. And prior, I had gone to a couple Canadian uh, libertarian events at a bar, called, um, at a bar in Toronto called uh, Popper's Pub. So I knew that they were good doing meetups there. So that's where I, I set it up and uh, put out a call for people that were interested to talk about Bitcoin and held the first, the first one. I think it may have been in October. I'm not exactly sure, but you could actually go into the Decentral meetup now and look back and see every single event that we've ever done. So you'll see the people that were in the event. Um, the first meeting we had, uh, Vitalik Buterin was there. That's where I first met him. Peter Todd was there. Think you know Mark was there, but I don't remember. I gotta I gotta clarify that with him. Um, uh, Ernest, the gentleman that I that I spoke to from from uh, local Bitcoins, he was there. So I think this was probably the first ever meeting of, of getting people together for Bitcoin, and it happened in, in yeah, I think it was October two thousand twelve. And from then on, I just started doing week uh, monthly meetups, and they started growing. I think there was about eight people the first event, eight or ten people. I think it was eight. And then it just started growing. We started getting into the hundreds uh, eventually over the next year. But near the end of 2012, 
uh, I knew it was about time to start. Okay, what do I want to do in this? Um, the idea of setting up a group was to kind of bring people together. And, and if, you, if you've got a community going, ideas really start flourishing and, and growing. And I think this is a perfect time for me. I couldn't, I wasn't, I don't think established enough to do this when the internet happened. But I saw this, I saw this really quickly as a way to empower people to be in control of their, their, their digital lives and be their own bank and be in control of their, you know, identities, communications, money, all of these things that have always been really important to me. And uh, I've understood the problems with centralized systems over the years. Uh, and uh, I just thought that this was a great opportunity with Bitcoin for me to grab it by the horns and take my entrepreneurial background, take my technology background, uh, principles that I've learned over the years and, and thought that this could be something good that I could provide value to people with and provide value in. And um, I ended up, uh, Reddit at the time was really the place that people would go and be learning and seeing all what's going on and happening with the Bitcoin, the R the R uh, Bitcoin um, threads. And there was a gentleman that uh, posted out a request for someone with business ideas. He was a developer and I responded. And a few days later, I flew down to uh, New Jersey to meet up with him and we started to say, okay, what are we going to start building here? And at the time, Satoshi Dice, uh, Eric Voorhees' uh, provably fair gaming system was really doing well. I think it was accounting for, I think it was half or even more of all the transactions that were going on in the Bitcoin network. Um, and it was a simple concept. He figured out a way to prove, I mean, because Bitcoin and, and crypto is all about trust and transparency and visibility and uh, open systems. So he had figured out a way to create a, ga a gambling site or a gambling platform that you could prove that the house wasn't cheating the player. So you could prove that the percentage house edge um, was, was fair. You could prove that um, it was trustworthy, unlike pretty much any other online gaming system at the time or mostly even now. You never know if, if the house is 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 cheating or, or has an edge. And Eric's concept uh, was very interesting to me. I mean, I, I think I gave him the credit for creating the provably fair gaming system. I'm not sure there were others before him, but um, between me and and the gentleman, uh, the developer I was working with, Steve Dack at the time, um, we said, let's, let's build a, a gambling site, a Bitcoin gambling site that is graphical though and and can provide some more uh better experience than what satoshi dice was doing because it was just a, a simple you send money from a wallet to an address and if you win you get your money back sent to the wallet so we ended up creating this thing called satoshi circle which was a kind of a roulette wheel spinning game visual through the browser that you know had penguins flying around and doing these things and you would deposit bitcoin and you would spin and it was provably fair and our house edge was less than what Eric's was, because when you have a certain house edge, which means the, the percentage of the house has the odds uh, in favor of them. For example, you might have a 3% house edge, which means that you know over, over 100 spins, there's a 3% there's a chance that the, the house is going to do better than you. And that's a, a pretty standard kind of system. So we made it a little bit less our house edge than what Eric was doing. And we put this thing out and it started doing really well right away. And Steve and I had always talked about, let's do something that's going to enable us to do better things in the future. Let's build something now that we think we can make some money with so that we can then do something greater with it. I mean, gambling was not something that I, I'm not a gambler really. I have never really been a, a, a big gambler at all. And we're like, I think this is a good opportunity for us to create something that we can then make some money with, and then let's do something bigger down the road. So we launched it. It did really well. Um, this was near the end of 2012, early 2013. Uh, at the same time, the meetups were, were going well. I was very interested in, in expanding out my community. So I, I um, decided to, to set up a national nonprofit organization so I could start connecting with others in Canada, not just in Toronto. Uh, at the time, the Bitcoin Foundation, the organization that kind of came about as a, an American entity to help promote Bitcoin, uh, was going through some issues at the time. It wasn't getting the international recognition that they were hoping for because it ended up being a number of Americans on the board. I think Charlie was on the board and 
Peter uh, Presesnes was on there as well. And there was a lot of pushback at the time because they, uh, a lot of people around the world saw this entity, the Bitcoin Foundation, as an American organization that was trying to control an, a decentralized technology. And it was full of board members that were American. And it, it just, there was a lot of um, issues that people saw with that internationally. And when I wanted to set up the, the Canadian, a Canadian entity to help promote Bitcoin, to work with the media, all the things that are needed as, a, as, a, uh, as an organization to help uh, push something that you're interested in uh, or bring it to light, things that you're interested in, uh, I learned what the Bitcoin Foundation had done. And I didn't just set up something and say, here, I'm doing this. I'm going to be the, on the board. I'm, this is the way it's going to work. I learned from the what I saw the, the Bitcoin Foundation mistakes potentially had done. It wasn't as inclusive as it should have been. It should have had more uh, democratic uh, organization and structure. So I decided to put out a press release across Canada. Uh, I paid for it, put it out, basically saying that, that I'm a fan of Bitcoin. I'm interested in setting up an organization that helps to promote it, that helps to uh, get the media interested in it. And, and, and I'm looking for light minded individuals that might want to help me create such a thing. So I put out the press release and started getting calls from people across Canada. Uh, I remember getting in, I think, I think remember Reed Holmes was one of those guys that reached out to me or uh, Reed from Nova Scotia. I had people from BC, every single province, people saw this press release and I, I just started speaking to them on the phone and getting to know them and starting to learn more about what they're interested in and start. So still doing the Toronto meetups, but now I'm starting to connect with people across Canada. And I waited a while and then I put out a second press release. And what I was doing uh, when I was connecting with people is getting more ideas from them. And hey, what would you think about this if we did this? And so over time, I put out a second press release with the objective of stating, okay, it's now time to set this organization up. Um, here's, what, here's what I'm looking to do. I'm looking to see if there's people interested in, in being on the board of this organization. And I'm also looking to see if there's people that are not interested to be on the board, but are interested in being in the selection process or the voting press process to select who's going to be on the board. And I said, you can't do both. So the idea was to have a separate organization that was going to be responsible for selecting the board members that had put in and submitted applications. So I was requesting that if you wanted to be on the board to submit an application and then there'd be a separate independent group that would review those in those those um, those applications and then vote and decide who's going to who's going to be on the board. And I followed the same process. I had to, I applied for a position on the board. I, I put in to this independent organization. I wasn't involved in the independent organization. It was just people that responded back and said, hey, I don't want to be on the board, but I'd, I'd be happy uh, deciding who's going to be on the board. So we ended up with a dozen or so, 15 people that wanted to decide who would be on the board, and then about nine or 10 people that wanted to be on the board. And the applications were submitted. We had a website that was designed to do the voting process. The independent organization looked at all the applications and they then selected eight people, I think we decided, and we'll go with eight board members. Um, yeah, so there was actually maybe there's there about 15 people that submitted. I forget the actual forget the actual numbers, but they then looked at the applications, thought about who the best ones were, and then announced who the board was. They then disbanded that or, that that group, and the board members were now tasked with being responsible for carrying on on the on the organization. This is an example of something which uh, you know, if you do something in a way that that everybody feels that was fair. Everybody feels that it wasn't in, in any way um, rigged. Now you might not always come up with a, 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 you know, a, a foolproof method, but that type of thinking has always been important to me. It's okay, there's a problem that we had. The problem we saw was that if this is not done properly, people are gonna say, well, who are you to do that? Or how did you get selected? So being able to always check the boxes and, and come back and say, well, you know, I, I applied myself and I didn't pick this group. The group was submitted and anybody could be on that group. And we did it through press releases to make sure that Canada was aware of what was. So it, that was kind of the process that I started to set up the Bitcoin Alliance of Canada. Um, the board then nominated me as the director. 
So I became the, the director of the Bitcoin Alliance of Canada. Um, I, I funded it initially, got it off the ground. We set up the structure, nonprofit organization. I uh, worked with Stuart Hogner at the time. You remember Stu. Mm-hmm. Um, Stu had worked with us on Satoshi Circle and, and had worked on the Bitcoin Alliance of Canada. He actually did a lot of our, our legal stuff there. So now there was this organization that was growing in the early of 2014 who was working to connect Canada. And, and I started traveling around the world, uh, going to conferences. And, and now I started expanding out internationally. So, um, you know, Toronto's done now. Canada. So it's, it, it was becoming like, how do I become that center of gravity to kind of get things off the ground and, and, and be someone that's going to help to lead, lead things and bring people together and get ideas flowing. So when I got nominated to the, the, as the director there, I didn't want to do the gambling site anymore. I thought it would be a conflict in the stuff that I was doing, just a little bit of gray area there. So we decided to sell. And after a few months, um, we were able to sell Satoshi Circle for a few thousand Bitcoin. Um, this was like after four months or something like that. So here I am. Uh, this is when the, the Bitcoin was, was worth about a hundred bucks, I think, uh, was when we sold. So after selling, this is early 2013. Now, you know, Bitcoin had gone up to 1200 bucks. This was the whole Mt. Gox thing had happened. The price had gone up crazy. After a few months, now with the Bitcoin that I had bought at ten dollars, and then for the sale of the entity of the organization, and we did it all for Bitcoin. We didn't sell for cash. So, at hundred bucks, it was at, and then it proceeded to go up to twelve hundred bucks. After a few months, I'd been doing pretty well already in the space, and it was exactly where I wanted to be. The idea that okay, the community is being set up now. We've got now funding in order to do other things, more productive things. Um, I'm traveling, going to conferences, representing Canada and, and starting to meet people internationally. And yeah, I'm super enthused. I'm super, you know, I'm, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. And during that time, it's also, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to focus on the Bitcoin Alliance of Canada, but I'm also going to keep my eye open for other things that potentially be going on that I want to get involved in. And my partner, Steve, who had done Satoshi Circle with me, um, I'd gone down to New York City and it was, I think it was inside Bitcoins, I think. And someone had gone on from, um, is it Web3, not Web3, from the, the standards, the web standard, I forget, I forget what it's called. But his premise of his talk was all about how do you put the wallet in the browser and the idea that the wallet, and this had already occurred to me, you know, with Bitcoin, you need a wallet. With any digital asset, you need a wallet to manage it with. And I equated the wallet to the browser for the internet. The, the, the browser is what, is what the masses utilize to manage and move information. It's the thing that, uh, the interface that connects an individual with the inner workings of the internet. You need it in order to make sense of, of what's going on with the internet. And the wallet, is very similar, I see, with cryptocurrencies. It's the idea that the wallet is needed to manage and move value now, not about just necessarily information. It's about so allowing you to, to hold the keys that represent the assets that you own and you're able to then send them to other people and you need a wallet to do that. So with Satoshi Circle, we kind of had a wallet already. We were, people were depositing Bitcoin onto the site, they were playing and then they were withdrawing but we were taking custodianship of the Bitcoin. And at the time there was a wallet called InstaWallet. Do you? Of course. Yeah, it was a HTML5 wallet where you would be given a secret key and we'd actually used it to divvy out funds when we set up Satoshi Circle to get people to try it. We would hand out some InstaWallets to people that had Bitcoin on it. but they got hacked, they had a problem and funds were lost. So my partner and I, we started thinking about, about can we translate what it is we did there into creating wallets? And that's the, the browser, that's the genesis, the browser wars with the internet. This is kind of similar to the wallet. I don't wanna call it wars, but the understanding that, that you need a wallet, there's gonna be a few wallets that went out 
people use them to manage things, they're going to be the interfaces for this whole new decentralized world, this, this whole new world that's emerging. So we set about starting to build wallets. And we translated what we had done with Satoshi Circle and started building a product called Rush Wallet. And Rush Wallet was supposed to be the uh, the, the, the come after Insta Wallet. It was okay. And what year are we in now, Anthony? And has the house come yet? No, we're still in. This is 2013. So we're still we're still in 2013, uh, about mid 2013, where we started building wallets. Okay, okay, okay. And we wanted to create an Insta wallet that wasn't holding customer funds. It was an Insta wallet. It was a wallet product where you have the keys, and that was the one major difference that Insta wallet did and how they got, got it. hacked is because they were holding people's money. So we said, how can we devise a system where we're not holding the customer keys? And we started creating this web HTML, it's HTML5 uh, site called Rush Wallet. And we were using blockchain.info's infrastructure in order to get pricing and to send transactions to the network. So we had it all ready to go, this Rush Wallet. It, was, it, was, it wasn't it was holding customer keys. You would get a unique URL. That URL would have a secret key inside the URL and only you would have the URL. So you would just bookmark the page and you'd be able to get back to your wallet, just like Insta Wallet had. But the funds were not held by us. They were held, the keys were held by the end user. So, uh, so we were getting ready to launch that product and set it. And then blockchain.info changed something on their infrastructure and it messed us up. And we ended up dropping the project because we didn't, we, we couldn't, we, we were at, we were beholden to what they did and any change that they did would screw us up. And that wasn't a good system. And back, back then to, to have the infrastructure to be able to um, support what wallets need, which is being able to fetch transactions very fast, which is able to send and receive transactions to the network. It really, it, it did not exist. And it was really difficult to, to get that stuff together. So we put it on hold for a month or two, but then we started, we started saying, okay, is there, is there another way that we can start doing this? And we ended up creating a Chrome extension Bitcoin wallet. And we set up a company, me and my partner, we called it CryptoKit and it was at Inside Bitcoin in the end of 2013, where we launched, we launched CryptoKit, we launched our first wallet product. And we went to the conference down there, CryptoKit got a lot of press. Uh, it, it, it actually was getting a lot of, a lot of attention just because we created something that was instant, that didn't have passwords, where we weren't holding on to customer funds. All these principles that, that I've continued and, and, and stuck with, such as, uh, the ethos of crypto, the ethos of Bitcoin is empowering people to be in control of their digital life. That's the way I see it. To be in control of their money, their identity and communications. Those are the three pillars that I see that if you have those three things that are in control of the individual in a decentralized fashion, any software product that is enabling that to happen is going to be something pretty good. So we've always built on the premise of never having or holding customer funds not liking login systems or passwords using standards that if we ever disappear you're still going to be able to use the product because what good is a system where if, if we fall off the face of the earth you now don't have access to your bitcoin anymore so these are kind of principles that we started putting together and started building on based on the principles of of, of bitcoin the, the principles of decentralization so we launched CryptoKit, started doing really well um, at the same time, my meetups were now over a year in and they're getting into the hundreds and it becomes really difficult to host meetups at bars and restaurants. I'm sure you know about that. Uh, yeah, it, it's challenging. You, you never because, you know, these are free events. I was never charging anybody to, to come to these meetups. I, it's just, mm -hmm. you, you want people to be able to go. So we're always figuring out how do we balance being able to have a venue with, you know, the inconsistency of the venues not being able to uh, commit because you're not paying them for the event space. So it was challenging to do them in restaurants. By that time we had moved over to Charlotte room. I think the, the event started happening there then. And I started thinking, how do I, how do I put together a space in Toronto, a physical space where I can continue these meetups and, uh, there were a lot of people doing doing local Bitcoin trading back in the day. And I saw that when you get people in a room 
that are energized and passionate about something, the ice, the ideas really start flourishing and start growing. So true. It, it, yeah, you you know that from doing the same the same setup. Mm-hmm. Things like, well, I was inspired uh, by you, but yeah, but carry on. Yeah. So I started looking. I I, I by this time moved down Trent downtown because I knew that if I was going to get involved in this in Bitcoin, I, I had to be downtown. That's where things would be happening downtown Toronto. So, and I started looking for a space that I could either purchase or rent to set up a, a, a hub or set up a physical place to do the meetups, to do co-working space, to just, just a gathering space. And I, it was probably November or October, I found a place and I started uh, renovating and doing some work in it. And with the idea to host the first meetup of the new year in 2014 at this new space. Anthony, at that time, were there other physical Bitcoin spaces as well that you were quite aware of? I mean, I'm just trying to think. Like, yeah, the Bitcoin, was embassy, it... the Bitcoin embassy is the one that, that was there at that time. Montreal. In Montreal. So Got it. it set up the Bitcoin embassy. I'd gone there, visited them a few times. Um, so they, yeah, they were, I think, were the first physical location in Toronto. I don't even know if globally, maybe. Um, so you had the first meetup, Vancouver, second meetup, Toronto. Uh, first physical space, I think, was the embassy. Uh, and then, so we started planning for a January 1st, 2014 launch date for what I was calling Bitcoin Decentral. And the idea of, of Decentral being, I couldn't call it Bitcoin Central. It just doesn't equate with the decentralized nature. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, why not Bitcoin Decentral? So I kind of coined that term. And got the got the place ready. This this old kind of house. It was a commercial space, but it was a three floor, very narrow space, right coming off the highway leading into the city on Spadina in Toronto. And at the same time, end of November of 2013, uh, Vitalik, who I had been um, seeing frequently traveling, as I was traveling, he was traveling, working for Bitcoin Magazine. Uh, writing there, going to the conferences. So I'd continuously run into him at the different conferences that we were going to. And then he'd also be showing up at at the meetups, which I was doing. So I got to know him quite well. And he was helping out with CryptoKit. So he was doing some work with us there. In fact, um, Google had had, uh, taken down CryptoKit, the Chrome extension, mistakenly, as there were some uh, copycats of CryptoKit that had emerged. And they accidentally took us down along with the copycats and i remember being away one time i remember getting a call in the middle of the night and hearing and seeing reports on reddit that crypto kid had been taken down and people didn't know what to do because their keys were there and vitalik kind of jumped in and figured out how to get everybody their keys even if crypto kit wasn't there and then a couple days later google actually apologized put us back up and came out publicly and apologized and said no we're fans of bitcoin it was the first time ever that Google came Whoa. out. This was when Apple was shutting everything Bitcoin down. Apple had come out and said, we're not doing anything. Bitcoin. We're not allowing any apps. Run. So Apple had taken that approach. And we thought when crypto hit got taken down that Google was following suit. But no, they actually came out and made a statement that they mistakenly took down crypto hit and were not anti-Bitcoin. Uh, I think they did, not, they did that on Reddit, actually, uh, the Google team. So they put us back up. Uh, everything was good again. Vitalik had helped out too because people were really concerned. We had thousands of users by that time that, hey, I can't get my keys. The app's gone. What do we do? Um, now, if you had written down your wallet, key, you would have been fine. You'd be able to do another system, but a lot of people didn't. So I've been working with Vitalik and he had showed me the white paper at the end for Ethereum at the end of, no- of November 2013. At the same time, I had been connected with Charles Hoskinson uh, Charles had been uh, previously doing work with BitShares and Invictus, I think it was called Invictus BitShares, and he was doing work with the Bitcoin education uh, for the Bitcoin Foundation, Bitcoin edu- education program or something. And he was doing these these videos on Udemy back in the day, and we got connected because we were both doing uh, work for organizations that were helping to promote Bitcoin. So we got connected. I told him what we were building in the wallets and he was a super smart guy and thought that what we were building was like the crown jewel of 
a decentralized way to give people their own keys that you can then connect them and send and receive value. So he was really enthralled by what I was building with CryptoKit and he was helping out with things and ideas and concepts. So when Vitalik showed me the paper, uh, I showed it to Charles. And Charles, I said, here's what this guy Vitalik is doing. They didn't know each other. And I connected Charles with Vitalik. Um, at the same time, Vitalik had shown the white paper to a few other people, including Mihai Alize, which was his other founder of, of Bitcoin magazine. Uh, Amir Chetrit, who was a gentleman that Vitalik had gotten to know on the Color Coins project. Um, so you had very early on in December of 2013, the first few people, the core, who we called the, the fiduciary group, the, the, the FM, the fiduciary members, because Vitalik put the paper out. Um, we started talking about it on Skype in different groups. And it ended up that the five of us, Mihai, Amir, Charles, myself, and Vitalik, through November, it became agreed upon that we were going to be the founders of this project. And we started through November, through December, started establishing things and started started saying, okay, we need to set up an organization here if we're going to start hiring people to get this going. And I had the funding money because of what I'd done with, with, with my investments in Bitcoin. I had the money to fund this stuff. No one else had any cash to start doing this. So I started putting, putting money forward to start setting up uh, Ethereum Canada, which was the first organization, which was a for-profit entity, uh, was set up to start being able to hire people. But that was the only reason for it. I was the sole director of that, not for any reason except to get something off the ground and get it quick and going. So we started hiring uh, HR person. Uh, we started hiring legal. I reached out and, and started getting connected with a gentleman called Ad Addison Cameron Huff. Uh, he was a lawyer, a technology lawyer at the time that was very good at doing search engine optimization. So when I searched for technology lawyer Toronto, he was the first thing that came up. <laughs> so the next day he came to, came to, to the office to the central, this was in January, I think. And so start setting up legal, um, start setting up HR and started hiring people. And yeah, that, that's the core five people. I didn't, I, I had met Amir once in Las Vegas. Uh, I hadn't met personally me high only through, through, uh, through chat groups and stuff, but that was, that was the genesis of it. It was, it was the five founders, people that are willing to take responsibility for what it is that we were thinking about building, which is a, a major difference than what, uh, you know, Satoshi did. And uh, it has positives and negatives. You, you, I always realized when we were building wallets, you, people have to trust you. And if they don't trust you, and if you're not visible, you're, you're, you're going to have issues. So we all agreed that, that we had to be public in what it is we're doing. But in order to do that, we're the fiduciary members, we're the founders. I'm also putting money to fund this and get it off the ground. So this coincided with the launch of, of, of Bitcoin Decentral in January 1st, 2013. It became a massive meetup. Um, I had been approached by a, a, a gentleman named uh, Abdul Hasib. Um, he had started building Bitcoin ATMs and had reached out to me because he wanted me to be the first one to have one. And he was from Ottawa, him and his team at Bit Access. Bit Access? Bit Access? Bit Access, yep. Yeah. And he came down on the last week of December 2013 and mm -hmm. deli delivered to me the first Bitcoin machine from Bit Access. And it coincided with, with the launch of Bitcoin Decentral January 1st, 2013. So that was Toronto's first ever Bitcoin ATM. So the day that we launched Decentral, Bitcoin Decentral, was the day that we launched the first Bitcoin ATM in Toronto, the second one in the world, I think, after Waves in Vancouver. And there were hundreds of people that came to that event, the lineup to use the machine. You know, we were, we were in all the local newspapers. Toronto now has a Bitcoin ATM. And at that event, uh, a gentleman named uh, Joseph Lubin showed up. So... Joseph had uh, had who was uh, had his his parents in Toronto and was retired off of Wall Street, uh, living in Jamaica at the time. He was visiting his family over the over the holidays and heard about the meetup and came to our event. And 
I talked to him and Vitalik talked to him and we invited him back a few days later as we were doing some Ethereum stuff and invited him to the, to the North American Bitcoin conference that we were heading to in, in Miami that, that month in January. So he came over there and, and we started thinking he could add a lot of value to what it is that we were doing and he had funds as well. And at the same time, we had uh, a gentleman named Gavin Wood and Jeffrey Wilkie, two other guys that uh, were doing some development work on, on Ethereum. And there you had the initial eight Ethereum founders. So we ended up, oh, I think I just turned off my video by accident. There we go. So we expanded out the group, added another three people as founders, uh, Jeffrey, Gavin, and, and Joe. And now you had this team of eight founders, fiduciary members of this project that was getting launched. And um, that's kind of the, the genesis of how the, how the team formed uh, for Ethereum. And then the first half of the year was all getting set up and ready for the, for the crowd sale that we wanted to do to in order to sell Ether and the, the legal complications that we went through to try to make sure that we could sell to US citizens uh, and the, the battles that we had between developers and non-developers to try to make sure that legal didn't stop what it is we were trying to do, but we didn't want to go to jail for stuff. So it was interesting to be part of this, this team of eight um, equal founders uh vitalik did have an extra vote and did get double the endowment or the, the the initial founders pool that we had but aside from that you had eight people with with different philosophical backgrounds and different levels of of business backgrounds and it was very challenging to 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 work with this the, the group everybody and to make decisions and um over time slowly and slowly uh you, you, you had Charles who was kicked out of the project along with Amir in what we call the red wedding that happened in, in, in Switzerland uh, uh, before the crowd sale. Uh, a couple other people were added into the leadership team. You then had Joseph leave afterwards. I left after the crowd sale. Uh, Mihai, left. everybody, it, it just, you know, it, it went down to, we got things off the ground. Joe and I funded everything. Um, a lot of work from Gavin and Jeffrey to get the development work done. A lot of work with from Charles and Amir and Mihai and guys like Taylor Gehring and and um, Stefan Tual. We ended up with this massive team globally with hubs around the world in a very short period. Ended up raising the largest uh, crowdfunded project uh, of all time. Uh, um, Asterix being that there was one that was run for much, much longer. It was a game that, that made more money. But, you know, in a few months, we had 9,000 participants that gave money to buy a pre-product of Ether, uh, which is what we were selling as a product, uh, uh, this, this necessary fuel that was needed to power the Ethereum network once it would launch. We felt comfortable the way that we did it in terms of being able to sell this product to US citizens. We did. Um, we managed to put out a number of, of uh, proof of concepts along the way as we were leading up to the sale. And then a year later, the, the Ethereum came out and people's wallets were filled. And uh, yeah, I guess the rest of the rest is history with that. But uh, after leaving Ethereum in 2000, end of 2014, 2015, continued building wallets. Uh, our, our product is called Jax. So we changed the name from Bitcoin Decentral to Decentral after we started Ethereum, realizing it's not just about Bitcoin, there's going to be other things. Uh, Decentral makes Jack's Liberty, which is our flagship product, and that's what I'm still doing to this day. Uh, along the last few years, our focus has always been on infrastructure and creating scalable infrastructure to connect to not just Bitcoin, but to all the different chains. That's what I think we're most proud of is the, is the infrastructure that we've built over the last couple of years that was a culmination of eight years of learning that the problems with infrastructure and scalability and interoperability problems as you're trying to, to support more and more coins. Um, right now, we've got users all around the world. Uh, we stick to the principles of never holding our access to customer funds. We're on seven different platforms. Uh, and it's all about empowering people to be in control of their life. And that's the tools that we've been building for first Bitcoin and then Ethereum and then dozens of other uh, uh, protocols that we support and tokens that we support. And that's, that's where we are now. I've been focusing on Jax and the team at Decentral for the last number of years. Uh, again, mostly on, on infrastructure. And uh, 
that's 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 what we've been building and and uh, why don't I take a break there? I've been talking for a while, but yeah, there's a lot there. But, but it's kind of, that's the early days, right? That's the early days. Hey, Anthony, just just curious, like, how, what what was it that you saw in that white paper or kind of in those conversations, those early days, that made you think? I mean, because Vitalik was super young at the time. Um, you know what I mean? I don't even know how many other. Uh, aside from Bitcoin, I remember Litecoin, there was probably a handful of crypto assets that were out there. But how are you able to, I mean, like now in retrospect, it's like kind of in hindsight, it's obvious, but but so early on, how are you able to kind of grasp, uh, you know, some of what you did? Like, I mean, just curious on that front, like, what was it about that initial vision that really captured your imagination? So, so Vitalik, getting to know him, uh, reading what he was writing in Bitcoin magazine. I mean, he's to me always the best writer for, for crypto. Uh, seeing his, him mature over the year that he was traveling around the world, dropped, up, dropped out of university, was traveling around the world, learning what other projects were struggling with. So he was visiting the MasterCoin teams and the BitShares teams, and they were all trying to build on Bitcoin. And he was understanding what the, what the issue we're trying to build on Bitcoin was. So he was a super reliable guy. Uh, he was writing articles on me and what I was doing with the Bitcoin Alliance of Canada and setting things up. So we just connected a lot and I trusted him, thought he was super smart. Um, the white paper, when I read it, it made sense to me, but it was the validation from Charles that really was the, yeah, this is, this is something. Charles, you know, I always looked up to his, his knowledge and, and super, super smart guy. So getting validation from Charles, knowing Vitalik, um, just, it felt right. It felt like, 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 you know, I, I, it just, it just all made sense to me. And that's, that was the, let's go in, let's go all in on this. And at the time, Bitcoin had dropped in price. So it went up to 1200, came back down. And what I, I had had in terms of a large pool of capital, it actually diminished quite a bit because of the way the market's going back down again. So it was a, it wasn't just, okay, I'm going to put free money to do this. It was, you know, this is, I got to, I got to feel pretty comfortable with this. I, I put quite a bit in, it was a few hundred grand that I put in leading up to the crowd sale. Uh, Joe had put in a few hundred grand. I think we spent about $800,000 total leading up to the crowd sale. Um, but it was even a time when I borrowed money off my dad to do this, to keep the projects funded and going because there just wasn't capital coming in. And we didn't want to have outside capital investments. We wanted to keep it tight to the group because as soon as you start getting in VCs and getting in, it, it, it starts turning into a can of worms and um, the fewer people, the better. And even having eight partners there was something I was not for. I, I, I the less, the better for me, the less decision makers is, is better because it, it becomes very um, arduous to get, to get decisions made and, and uh, very challenging. And I'd learned this from partnerships in the past and I had a lot of business experience. So a lot of the guys didn't, Vitalik was only 18 at the time. Mihai was quite young. Um, Charles even, Charles was only 25 at the time, which blew my mind when I found out how old he was later on, because I, I thought he was my age. I'm, I'm 45 right now. The thought that Charles was 25 when this thing started, like he does not look like a 25, he did not look like a 25 year old. So it was, it was, if it wasn't that I feel, if I didn't feel it was such an amazing opportunity, I wouldn't have got involved because it was not. I'd learned that, that, that I, I want to um, make, if, if I'm putting the money in and I, I want to be making decisions and partnerships to me, it always been, it, it slows things down. And, and I always wanted to fund things myself. I don't like taking other people's money. So, but the amount of opportunity that I saw coming from this was worth it for me to join and to navigate this many, many founder pool of people and put the money in and do this. It was, it was a risk. But it just it seemed to make sense, and and I I, I did it, and and uh, yeah, I, I think it was it was Vitalik's smarts, Vitalik's reliability. Um, it was Charles being involved. Um, Amir was super smart, and then adding Joe and adding Gavin and adding Jeff. You know, it, we had a we had a pretty good we had a good team, and then it started to grow. We had like 50, 60 people that we were working all together with. Um, during the crowd sale and that, that we're, we're, we're doing many different things. So um, yeah, it was mostly Vitalik and, and then taking the idea to Charles and getting validation there. Uh, and then my, my year getting to know Vitalik 
and and just seeing what he could do and having trust and, and confidence in him. Well, that's really cool. Uh, Anthony, like, you know what? Uh, we're already starting to inch towards our, our 90 minutes, but I wanted to just ask you, you know, well, first of all, thanks for sharing that story. That was, uh, I thought I knew most of it, but there was a lot of stuff there that that I didn't know. And I, and I definitely learned a lot. I was going to say, just, just to kind of summarize, you know, and, and to try and pull out maybe some of the key lessons, like if you were to do this again, or if you were to talk to yourself you know, the 35 year old Anthony, and you could kind of give him a few, you know, pieces of like wise words of wisdom, like, uh, are there other things that you might, you know, might tell him? So I get this question, I, I've gotten this one before, and it's the idea of, you know, I wouldn't want to change anything the way that I would have done things, because I'm happy with the way things have turned out. So any little change of telling or learning something, if you haven't done it yet, you learn things when you learn them. Um, for me, uh, being principled is, is super important. Um, I've always tried to do things by, by being in control and not, uh, you know, having partnerships or taking investors' money has not been something that I'm, I'm too keen to do. Uh, with Jackson Decentral, we've never taken outside capital. Um, I don't like the idea of, of having to provide returns to investors and which can impact uh, the delivery of what it is I'm really trying to accomplish and do. So um, yeah, having, having, the, I, I kind of try to stick to the principles as I can in the things that I do. Uh, sometimes you have to change a few things. Like I did become partners with something because the opportunity was there, but in generally I've learned in the past that I work better when I can direct things. I can be really fast in what I'm doing. I'm using my own money to do things, not other people's money. So I can take it in, in time and do it as I think it needs to be fit. Because a lot of times projects due to the need to monetize or do things very early on, uh, you end up getting sidetracked from what is your mission, what you really want, want to do. So these are just things that I've learned over the years. Um, yeah. and, and, it, and it kind of goes to the ethos of crypto and it goes to the ethos of, of uh, I want to empower people. I want to build the tools that empower people to get the things that I want, which is more freedom. Um, I, I believe in personal responsibility. I think it's really important to, to have to work for things and, and get, get where you be based on your learnings. Um, I think the, the biggest lesson and what really is pushing me over the last few years is um, the idea that there's a really, um, the incentive world, uh, the incentive structures that the world lives on, I think are misaligned. Uh, I feel that the incentive is to have power and money. And I think that leads to a misalignment with other people and, and the planet. So I like to say that I, I, I like to, to solve problems. And I come from a, a, a dad who wasn't an inventor, or a problem solver, always questioning why. And things would drive him nuts when things don't make sense. So. I think I'm a, I'm a problem solver that can put together a number of things based on formulas I developed in the past and based on principles and tools that I've developed. And the idea of trying to create winning situations for everything, everybody is really important to me. Um, it's not about uh, creating divisiveness. It's about creating unity. Um, it's about uh, utilizing your strengths to create a better world. So what really is driving me now and in the future is to see how I can help to change the incentive structures of the world. I think there's a cyclical possibility of the more impact that you create as an individual that is improving people's lives and considering as many people as you can in the things that you're creating, that you will do better in creating the wealth that you want, not the other way around. The drive for money, the drive for power, I think usually adversely impacts a large majority of the population. And I want to be the one that can help to show that no, the better you do to create impact that improves the world and improves and thinks about the majority of the population and is inclusive in what you do and creates a win, win, win for everybody, the more you will and better you will do, whether you be a brand or an icon, you have the opportunity to showcase what you're doing is for the good of humanity. It's, it's creating positive impact. And I believe that that's what's going to give you what you really want, not the other way around. And most people, most um, scandals that have happened, most documentaries you might watch are based on greed. They're based on situations where uh, 
The desire is to improve shareholder return or and maximize shareholder return. Month after month, you're going to keep producing uh, better returns. And that goes contrary to, um, I think, what's needed in order to uh, drive brands and people, which is, are we really doing good, though? Is it all about making the money? Because making the money is discluding all these people and people aren't happy and people are going to want to come after us because we're do people are doing things that aren't good. Well, if you shift it and you start creating positive impact, and your brand stands for positive things. It stands for empowering people. It stands for creating winning situations, not, not, not dividing people. It, it needs leadership. The world needs leadership. It needs ideas. It needs problem solvers that are going to bring solutions. And it's, it's about thinking outside of the box. And it's about thinking differently. And the idea of maximizing shareholder returns, I think, is leading to a lot of the problems the world is facing. And we need to create that shift. So the idea that you can still get what you want by creating positive impact just requires you to think a little bit more. Think a little bit differently. Think about a formula that's going to create positive wins for as close to 100% of the population as you can. Not disclude 80% of the population and what you're doing. And now 20% is only what you're doing. You got People got to think better. They got to they gotta, they gotta think like the traditional models are, are just not working. We need to, and entrepreneurs need to, problem solvers need to, to think of new ways to do things that will bring everybody on your side, that will provide solutions for the majority of the population, not the minority of the population. So although my tool belt includes blockchain, includes crypto, includes building tech, and includes these things, I really want to see how I can take what I've learned and start creating um, a way for brands and icons to maximize their impact positively and provide them with solutions to do that. And that's where my mind is really focused on right now is creating formulas that can generally solve any type of problem out there. And it can take what positives and benefits each person has because everybody has something they're good at everybody has something they're not good at and everybody has a problem and i think putting it all together to activate people that are good at certain things like icons are really good at, at being able to get uh their followers to do things well do they have the right plans in order to activate their followers to do good things so how do we create a platform and a program that is giving icons the tools that they need to connect better with their fans and the masses to help solve impactful problems. So that's where my mind is going is, is creating a platform for, and I'm calling it icons of impact, using a problem solving formula, which I call perfect formula, which provides the tools that empowers icons. And these icons can be brands, they can be singers, they can be athletes, that empowers them to activate and create movements of people who are dedicated to creating positive impact on the world. And that's kind of where I would like to shift my attention towards. Interesting. And, and uh, oh, so I know, Anthony, you've alluded to this in the past in some of our conversations, but is this, what? how does this look as it comes into the world? Is it like an app? Is it a, a retreat? Is it, uh, you know, I mean, what, I mean, or, or is it TBD? Like, are you keeping it kind of under wraps for now? <laughs> no, it's more of an idea that mm. if anybody wants to carry it out and do it, I'd support. It's not about who's. I see. I see this platform because I, I, being an investor in this in, in different spaces, not just in crypto, but I'm seeing that that what what artists, musicians, icons are really lacking is the ability to to monetize and feel comfortable that that they're maximizing their assets or their skills. Musicians, difficult time working with platforms these days, just like they've had difficulty times working with record labels in the past, but they feel they're being squeezed. They feel that, that the platforms that are out these days, the Spotify's, the iTunes, they're, 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 they're necessary, but they're not, they're creating tension between artists and they're feeling they're not getting what they're rightly deserving of. Uh, athletes, the same type of way. So I'm seeing different companies trying to tackle different sides of it. And the end of the day, it's, it's, it's not whether you're a musician or a, uh, an athlete or a brand. You don't need a, a different system. I think there's, there's one system or platform that can emerge that is providing the tools that any icon, and I call, that's why I call it icon. I like the word. An icon could be a brand. It can be an athlete. It can be a musician. It's where icons can come to a platform, can give the tools to connect them to 
people that are willing to, to act, be activated to create positive change. And then the icons are responsible for, for they'll get the recognition, but they're not the problem solvers. That's Interesting. one of the keys that I figured out was that to be a problem solver, like, like most foundations, organizations out there, they're not problem solved. They're trying, but they're, they're out of their league to really figure out how they can even get sustainable funding, which is a problem. You got entities out there that are that are doing they'll do galas and they'll do events and get people there to hear give us money because we're trying to support the polar bears oh, okay that's great but i don't care about the polar bears i have my own problems so a lot of foundational and, and a lot of organizations can't get the proper funding because the people that are giving the money uh, have their own problems and it's not a sustainable model so i realized that it's these organizations they're not capable of really trying to solve the problems they're trying to but they need people and entrepreneurs and problem solvers to give them the ideas in order to to, to activate it because everybody's good at something everybody has a problem and everybody's not good at something um a a, a, a you know i had some i had a chance to go down and, and spend some time with leonardo DiCaprio and, and talk to him about his foundation and the problems that they were facing and in what are the, i came up back with so many different ideas and thoughts about, okay, well, you know, you're not a problem solving Leonardo, your foundation isn't a problem solver. You're trying to raise money to solve this problem, but you're, that's not really what you're good at. You're good at activating uh, your fans potentially, or you could be an ambassador for a program, but your organization or your entity is not the kind of people that are going and creating things that, you know, technology solutions or forward thinking things that that the most entrepreneurs in the space that I'm involved with are, they're the problem solvers. So it's like, what are your problems you're trying to solve? How do you get, how do you get the proper funding to do it? How are you creating initiatives that are going to start local and think global rather than trying to boil the ocean and trying to do everything? Well, I've come up with a lot of tools and a lot of principles that I think can help to provide the solutions for entities that really want to create a lot of impact and positive impact. So, you know, it, it's, it's a lot to get in. I've got a lot of writings and a lot of formulas and a lot of things that I mean, processes and tools to put this all together. And it's probably not the right time to dig into too much more, but it, it's the idea that we can create impact and you can still get what you want by creating positive impact. And you're going to get better recognition for doing that. And if you're not doing that and the things you are doing are not creating positive impact, the generations that are coming up now aren't going to, aren't going to uh, like that very much. So brands need to figure out how to connect to their audiences. And I think you do that by, by creating uh, better lives for people, by solving people's problems. And that's where I'm, I'm looking for icons and brands to, to utilize, to do, but they need the, the problem solvers to think about this stuff. Uh, well, I couldn't agree with you more, Anthony. Hey, listen, I want to be mindful of your time because I, I know we'd only booked uh, about 90 minutes or so. I would love to do a follow-up and go deeper into this because, like I said, we've touched on it a few times in conversations. It sounds, I mean, like, look, I mean, UnoCoin is a function of us asking how do we solve our own problems, right? Like, uh, uh, yeah, so so I, I definitely, definitely prescribe to that. And, and like I said, is, is, you know, if, if this platform that you're talking about, thinking about, you want to kind of get it out there, uh, would love to be, you know, um, a yeah, student it's, of it. <laughs> it's, 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 it's something that I'm not, uh, my focus right now is Decentral. My focus is, is Jax and maximizing what we've done with that. Um, so that's where my, my attention is focused on right now. Um, but in the back of my mind, really where I want to take things and do things is, is to create a platform using technology, using tools and processes I've created that creates a shift of incentive structures away from making money and, and greed to, to making impact. Um, and I've got a lot of pieces to put together to that, but that'll come in time. I love it. I love it. Anthony, well, as I've said many times before, you, you're a huge inspiration to, well, I'm sure many others, uh, but including myself. Um, in, in closing, anything you want to share in terms of where people can just kind of follow you and, and learn more about you and uh, keep up with your work? Uh, not really. Um, a few years ago, I, 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 wasn't, I, I didn't really like being in the limelight too much. Gotcha. Mm. Things went up and I, I have a love-hate relationship with social media. Uh, I don't really use any social media anymore. Um, I, I think actually one of the, the greatest learnings over the last little while is I think technology is our biggest uh, threat mm. to humanity. Uh, everything's a double-edged sword, so technology provides a lot of great things to people, but I'm also really scared at where these, 
these incentive models of advertising have led to these conglomerate monopolistic uh, social media entities being able to direct people and subliminally be able to, um, you know, with, with the advancement of AI, be able to create algorithms that people aren't, aren't understanding that they're being brainwashed and they're, they're being led into directions because they're not savvy enough to understand what's going on. And it's leading to divisive tribal mentalities and states. And we've seen it in politics and many other things. So I, right now, there's really nowhere to follow what it is I'm doing. Um, so no, unfortunately, unfortunately not. If anybody does want to email me, um, my, my email is anthony at decentral.ca. Not sure I'll, I'll be able to respond, but uh, I am thinking more and more how I can, it, I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm not, not feeling good, you know, advertising stuff. Sure. Sure. Makes yeah, sense. I, mean, I hear you. No, it's not because I don't want people to know it's, it's, it, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's, it's weird. I, I struggle with a lot of different things, um, in terms of, um, visibility, non-visibility, how do I market products that I'm doing, but I don't like marketing and I don't like, so it, it's challenging. Um, email is good to reach me by, uh, that's probably the, the best thing, but maybe in time, I better think about how I can solve that and start doing some writing more and putting some things out. But uh, right now, social media is not a good way for me. Cool, cool. Well, Anthony, thank you again very, very much. This was amazing. I really, really appreciate you doing this because uh, yeah, it was really special. Awesome. Thanks well, for putting and thanks for you've done so many i've heard and, and you're really blasted in this sunny so keep it up yeah and, uh, yeah and as you were telling your story it was like addison we did uh, an interview with him last week i was thinking yeah, about I connie heard. at BitGive, and uh we yeah. just uh, it was yeah. hers a few days ago and tatiana i just interviewed her yesterday so thinking about music and i didn't want to interrupt but like yeah my goal is really to kind of you know just capture all these different viewpoints right and all everyone's stories because how many times have i i said I feel like I live in a movie. Like every day in this world, whatever we've found ourselves in feels like a movie. And I always used to joke, I'm like, someday there'll be a Bollywood movie made about it. And I thought, wait, hold on. There could, there could be. Uh, Maybe. <laughs> there's also, I mean, there's a couple of books that have come out this, this, this year on Ethereum. Um, oh, right. There's a book that's coming out, right? Oh, no, there's two that are already out. Two. Oh, okay. Two that are already out. Um, uh, yeah, I was involved with, with with both of them. There's a lot of a lot of time in it. It's really, I've been really happy with what they've done with those those two books. One kind of focuses more on the DAO uh, because it was the second book that came out on Ethereum. But it's, it's all the history of Ethereum and, and the history of, of how everything came together. So there's there's two books out right now. Um, the first one is called I think it's How a Group of Crypto of Hackers Are Creating the New Internet, I think. And then the second one is, geez, I don't even remember what the second one is. It's, it's, I don't know if it's got Ethereum, but it's you know, that, that might be a good place for people to start and they can learn more about what's, what's going on there. There's a lot of history stuff on, online there. Uh, cool. And, and Anthony, if there's anyone else that you, you think that, you know, you think would be cool to like capture their, their side of the story, you know, just hit me up, let me know. Um, cool. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Anthony. Yeah. I'm going to bring this one to a close and we'll do it again soon. Thank you. Okay. Enjoy your weekend.